All right. Hello and welcome to the Southbound Sports Show. I'm your host and Top Gun, Richie Leahy, here finally in first place at Fantasy Baseball. And this, just like last year, once I got in first place, I never looked back. Back to back champion. That's going to happen. I'm going for the three peat here with Matty B, uh, football coach. If you haven't listened before, he is starting, what, what was it? Heat conditioning this past week. Heat conditioning was last week, and we are into actual fall camp this week. You want to give some thoughts on that first? At the point that we're, we're at now, I really can't stand the heat acclimation days. It, a lot of it is it's bureaucratic, cover your tail stuff because all summer now because of all the concussion protocols with the seven on sevens and different things that you do the kids are out in the sun they're running they're playing they're wearing their helmets they're doing all this stuff and it's like then you have to almost backtrack in a certain aspect because then it's like oh wait for heat days you have to have so many days of practicing with the team before you're able to go into your you know your fall camp and be able to put pads on and if you don't you know get a full week of practice with that then you're not able to a scrimmage, and I think it, it holds some of the kids back. You know, I, I would much rather see them just go after it and just say, you know, this is when you can start camp and leave it up to the schools to decide how what level of padding do you want to go. So or that how is how much hitting you actually want to do. So that's a law that they put in place. You have to do heat acclimation or whatever you call it. Kids have to have heat acclimation, and actually, it's it's even in North Carolina. You know that was something that was going on that you'd practice all summer, and then you'd have to go back down to like just helmets or you know minimal amount of equipment and run for so many days. And it, I always thought that it was really stupid because you're out there doing, you know, wearing your helmet and helmet shoulder pads for stuff, and then all of a sudden you got to take it all back off. It was like, well, you've been doing it the whole time. Why not just continue with it? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but, all right, we'll kick it off here. Uh, also with us, Rick David. Uh, sorry to cut you off, Matt, from a weird transition. But um, Rick's here. I was ready to talk trash. I'm wearing the Top Gun hat. He told me I was not allowed to buy because last year he said he would never, he or what do you say, refuse that's I think that's the word you used. That was the word I used. I refuse you winning it for a third time. So Actually, I'm in second place right now, making a run for the Top Gun spot again. At the beginning of the year, I do believe you said that you hope I win. Uh, I did when uh, some of the bottom feeders all decided to cry that they weren't good <laughs> enough. And it's called study for your draft. So for fantasy people out there. Study for your draft and don't draft 95 year old guys and think, holy crap, they're going to make it through a 162 game season. Okay? You don't want to draft the 45 year old arm and hope that he gets through, you know, all season. When mid May, he'll probably be thinking about retirement. Hey, I like to draft my guys or pick them up as soon as they get back from uh, performance enhancing drug suspensions. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Chapman did a few years ago and like Marte this year. It seems to work pretty well for me. I'm surprised that that doesn't blow up in your face. That they come off the all those like performance drugs and then they have to go back to like their natural body's hormones that aren't being produced anymore. And you would think that there would be a decline in production. I was actually looking at my roster before this because I was I made I made the like I noticed. I'm pretty sure I have at least four guys on my team that have been suspended for steroid use. Braun, Chapman, Marte, and crap, I can't remember off the top of my head who the fourth one is, but I'm pretty sure I have at least four and probably some other ones I don't even realize were suspended. But Matt, when I look at it, I think of this. These guys are willing to go above and beyond to win. And that's who I want on my fantasy squad. Guys who I can count on to win. Uh, but well, speaking of that, well, not fantasy baseball. Uh, well, we might as well touch on the Pirates. Pirates in the NL Central, because Matt, you're a Cards guy. Uh, cards have been surging right now. Do you think they're going to win the division? Ooh, 
that that's a that's a tall order. I think they have it in the cards that they possibly can. They're a game and a half back right now, but right now they're getting shelled, I think, by Boston. So they they could end up dropping a game unless the Cubs somehow fall out to the Reds. Um, they're playing they're playing great ball. All right now, if they can continue doing what they're doing, get the rally cat going, then who knows? I mean, they definitely have have the potential to do it. It just just seems like they always have issues with their relief pitching at some point that it's suspect. And will they will it last long enough for them to put a, put a run together? I think is the question that needs to be answered. Uh, Rick, what are your thoughts on the division before I give mine? Uh it's it still looks like it's anybody's game out there right now the pirates are in a 1-1 tie they just tied it back up here and st louis was last i checked losing nine not that mike leak just got shelled who's on my fantasy team and on the bench this week good decision there but the thing is this was the opportunity for the pirates they were playing three weeks almost until they hit this brewer series of playing teams that were below 500 in they were never, they made up ground in a couple of games, maybe like three or four they made up, but they're still four and a half back. So, but I think really now for this division, since nobody's still claiming it is really going to be one in September when they play pretty much all inner division games. I mean, they major league baseball give them credit. They changed around September to pretty much be inner division and make these run these close races. And for some divisions, it's going to be a, joke because nationals are running away with theirs and nobody's above 500 outside of them in their division but realistically you have four teams in the nl central so this could be anybody's game and milwaukee's trying they went out and got neil walker gotta give him credit they had a set problem at second base jonathan villar wasn't hitting i think he was hitting 188 one last within like sometime within the past week and they benched him and they're gonna go with neil walker now so give him credit yeah i the Pirates seem to play to the level of their competition. And if they don't make it, it's 100% on them losing to these scrub teams. Uh, like you said, we talked about it on the show earlier. Uh, previously, a couple weeks ago, we said the Pirates have a chance here to put some separation bet- between them and 500. Just from a, d- from a record perspective, I want to say that they were projected by like one of the ESPN or MLB network stats for wins that they were going to have. 87 and they would win the division but didn't happen and it, it, it's dropping dropping because they're playing all these teams and they're not winning the series they're playing teams under 500 not winning now they do seem to play up against their own division and like you said it's going to be interdivision heavy the rest of the way out maybe they make a run i mean it's too close right now to wave the white or the yeah, other white flag and uh, put our flag at half mast here at Southbound Sports, but I just don't think. I honestly think the way the cards are running, they have a great chance at actually winning the division. Brewers have been tail spinning all year uh, since the All Star break, and the Cubs are going that way too. So, uh, but going back to the suspensions that I talked about for my fantasy team. Uh, We're going to talk about our first topic today. Ezekiel Elliott is suspended for six games by the NFL. And right before we came live today, or whenever I was putting this together, he is going to petition that with the NFL to try to get that dropped. I think the official charge in my notes here, it says that he is suspended due to NFL conduct policy. But it's definitely stemming from an alleged abuse incident that just to fill people in uh, his girlfriend I think it was his girlfriend I don't think she was his fiance or anything took pictures of some bruising on her arms and I think her legs possibly and they got leaked to TMZ Elliot said that she got beat up in a bar fight I don't know if there was a tape for that if I don't know where that was Uh, she said that it happened because of him that was the evidence that was put out there i don't think she went to the police right away and charges were were dropped from what i saw i don't know if they would bring it back with the pictures or what but he's not charged with anything charges are dropped very very similar to jordan lewis who the cowboys drafted from michigan cornerback 
He was alleged to have a domestic abuse case dropped in court. No evidence. Similar thing here in the Elliott case. Cowboys, he's fine. No punishment from the NFL. My beef with this is the NFL is so inconsistent that the NFL Players Association has to do something. It can't be, okay, here's a couple games for deflating a football. When that's science, we talked about it. I'm not a Patriots guy by any means. I like Tom Brady. But, I mean, there's science to disprove it. Just because the, the Colts got their asses kicked, they can't just say, well, well uh, the balls were a little bit low. Come on, the ref would definitely have touched that ball and been able to feel like, oh, shit, that's flat. I mean, I I have balls in the back of my truck that I always carry with me because you never know when someone wants to play a game of catch with you. So I grab it out. If it's cold, you know that ball is going to be flat. And you can tell as soon as you pick it up, like, I got to pump this up. Guess what? I also carry a pump with me for that very reason. So you have that going on. Big Ben, someone told me that Big Ben, uh, we had some people reach out complaining, saying that this suspension is karma due to the Big Ben one a few years ago where he was suspended for six games. He actually got his down to four, I believe. And... I don't know. I'm seeing, thinking that Elliot's going to get the same thing. I don't think they're going to get rid of him, but I do think they're going to drop him. Uh, but you can go ahead, Matt. What are your thoughts on this suspension? You hit the nail on the head. It's a, it's to me, it's purely about being consistent with your rules. And what are, what are you going to assign as punishment for one person? It needs to be consistent across the board. You, you know, and I don't understand why in a lot of these cases for one person, they get the book thrown at them. And for another person, it's just completely swept under the rug. You know, I, I understand that NFL is starting to get a negative um, sense of publicity because of so many domestic violence things coming out on their part. But I think that they need to make sure that they're, they're addressing things and handling this in a professional way. Rick, what are your thoughts? Yeah, my thoughts are, I think it goes along the lines of your status. If you're a superstar or not a superstar, I mean, Big Ben got a big suspension. Ezekiel Elliott, a superstar, gets a big suspension. Well, some of the other guys, you know, they get cut. If they do something wrong, speeding or something along those lines, they get cut. So they don't even get a suspension because they're already been cut. So it's already like, oh, they're done. So I, I think it's set, there is no consistency. It's whatever they want to choose, and that's what they're going to go with it. But I think that's going to be one thing that the Players Association is going to argue against. So uh, Troy Vincent and company is going to say, hey, what? where's the consistency? Why did you know? And so, and they're, I think they're going to use the Big Ben case, and they're going to say, hey, you dropped his, so drop Ezekiel Elliott's too. And I think they're probably going to get the drop on on the games and everything. So well, I can I, see that easily happen. The, the direct one-to-one -one comparison would be the Ray Rice case. That had clear evidence. There's a video of her, him like punching her in the face and then dragging her out of an elevator. My memory might be foggy on the details, but... It, like, I don't advise you to look that up, but that's a gruesome video that the NFL had. And did he get, what, two games, maybe? I didn't, initially, he didn't have any. So it's totally out of left field. If they set the precedent at, okay, well, this is someone who was charged and later kicked out at the NFL after the public backlash, I don't think Elliot, I mean, he's not charged. I don't think he should definitely not get kicked out of the league. I honestly think for him, being a young running back and running backs having a short shelf life, it's probably a blessing in disguise. Look at help Tom Brady last year. It's kind of like an extra break. Instead of playing, oh, I don't have to play the grind of 17 games. I only have to play, what, what was this, level 11? And then I'm right in time for uh, hitting my stride for playoffs. You saw it with Tom Brady last year. Running backs, I'd imagine it's even better. Now, for the Cowboys, they're probably, they have a tough schedule. Uh, we talked about them on our other preview, but I don't know. They just need to get consistent because it's not like – and I, they don't need to have a sheet printed out that's like, okay, you do this one game, two games, whatever. But at least just kind of be consistent across the board. You're not charged with the crime. What's the conduct policy? I mean, it's not like there's a video 
uh, like there was with Joe Mixon when he punched that chick right in the face. And I think he's in the league. And no big deal for him. He's with Cincinnati. Yeah. Well, of mm-hmm. course, that makes sense. Of course, they pick him up. <laughs> <laughs> the Bengals. <laughs> they wear those stripes for a reason, Rick. <laughs> But hey, the the other thing with that though is, uh, you know, as far I think the NFL does have that tape, and they're just not releasing whatever the footage is. I did see that. I forget exactly where I saw it at today, but I saw that the NFL does have the the whatever evidence that they're using in it, and they're just choosing not to release it to the public. So there must be something out there, and they're just choosing not to release it. That's going to be their grounds for upholding that suspension. Well, I wonder if that's the TMZ photos that I saw. Like, I mean, if if the court dropped it, I would have to say if there's a video, the court would, uh, with that being a hot topic, the court never would have dismissed it. Uh, the fact that it's it's circumstantial evidence, like he said, she was in a bar fight. And I'm sure they might have had other wis- witnesses to corroborate that story. I don't know. But for them to drop it, it just seems like something fishy is going on. Normally, the court would be the one to make that decision. If the NFL just didn't want these pictures to get out, then yeah, it makes sense. And if they're holding on to them, but you better believe it's going to get out like the Ray Rice video got out. They tried to hold on to that. Of course, TMZ is going to get it. It only takes one rogue uh, justice warrior in the organization to leak that. So someone going out there and making their decision. And it's going to work out. So we'll, we'll definitely, if they have further evidence, we're definitely going to see it. But I don't want to spend any more time on that. Just wanted to uh, bring it up because they need to be consistent. I don't think he su- should be suspended. I'm not a fan of the Cowboys by any means. Uh, so we'll go ahead, get talking about some games here. Wow. Oh, wow. The Steelers beat the Giants and it was awful. It was one of the worst performances at quarterback. I've ever seen, and I know it's only the preseason, and Dobbs is a rookie, but he's looking right over the middle of the field, throwing an interception. He's looking right over the middle of the field, deeper this time. Not The first one, I think it was the first one. It might have been the second one. I can't remember the order because I tried to block it out of my memory, but the one was like right to the middle linebacker. He didn't even really move. I mean, I guess if he would have rolled out a little bit, he might have had a better view to see him, but he just dropped right in there. I think it was a middle linebacker. Might have been uh, the outside linebacker dropping back or something. Easy pick uh, for the opposition. The The second one was deeper. And again, I think it might have been an underthrow, but you just can't make those mistakes. On the plus side, the Giants quarterback was way worse. He's missing wide open receivers. He would tuck his head down and just run. So because he couldn't get anything going, uh, the Steelers end up winning. So that's a positive. Guys get some ga- game reps. TJ Watt looked pretty good. But again, he looked good in college and now he's playing against scrubs. So I assume that the guys he's playing against are similar to college level guys. The bottom of the NFL guys aren't the top guys. Only the starters are probably like a 1% of football players across the country. So him beating up uh, those guys seemed like he was playing against a Minnesota in the Big Ten. And he had a good game. And that's what I expected of him. When he goes against that top percent, is he going to have the same impact? I hope so, but I don't know. Uh, Go ahead, Matt. You can kick this one off, too. I I know you were talking to me during the game. What were your thoughts? It was brutal. If from a fan's perspective, it was absolutely brutal to watch. Um, I agree with you with Dobbs quarterback. And I would have liked to have seen them use more of the rollout game or any kind of action to get him outside the pocket. It seemed like as the game progressed and he got into some some boot action and some different things where he could scramble, he played a lot better and actually had a couple completions down the line. But it just seemed like him dropping straight back, he just looked absolutely confused. The second interception, he, it wasn't even close. It looked like it was a choice route where the receiver could cut in or you know hitch up, and he threw it short, and the receiver was running by himself down the sideline. So it was clearly a miscommunication. But, you know, when I when you watch the Steelers versus the Giants, even when they have all their starters, it, it ends up being a field goal fest anyhow. You know, it, it never seems like they really put up a lot of points when they play each other, even though 
in the regular season, they have all these talented athletes. It just, it had that feel of the same old, you know, field goal teams to death that we normally get from these kind of teams. Rick, did you watch the game? And do you have any I, thoughts? I watched it on more on the repeat version. I didn't watch it in lifetime. Uh, I, the thing, okay, I'll, Watt did look good, I will say this, but the one sack, it was a total blown on the line. They, they forgot him. So it was an easy sack for him, but it was also problems with the f- offensive line of the Giants. But I, I will say this. I think the one thing I think the Steeler fans are going to think about is if Big Ben gets hurt, which he's had injury problems throughout the years and missed time because of injuries, we either got Dobbs or we got Jones. Two guys that I don't know. You would you want there them to be a starter for two, three, four, five games? We have one guy that wants uh, Jones to be the starter. Uh, okay. We have this, uh, we had some comments come through, and one okay. guy's very high on Jones. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about getting messages over a five day period, Rick. About he how. must have not seen the games last year where he played where he struggled massively. Um, I agree. He has to I, be a Sooners fan. I don't see any he, other way that he and, would want Jones they, to be the starter. And the Steelers loved him so much. Why wouldn't they have tried to re-sign him, re-sign him immediately after the season? No, they left him some time out there to go try to find somebody, and there was no huge backup quarterbacks. There was no version of Matt Hasselbeck out there this year to sign as a backup quarterback, so they had to bring him back. So I don't know. I, I It's scary to think that you're one injury away from having one of those two be a starter. Yeah, and I think that's – Well, I think with the trend – Go ahead, Matt. With the – with the trend that they had going, I mean, you look at the Raiders last year when Carr got hurt. You look at the Dolphins right now being in a mad scramble now that Tannehill's injured. You all, with the quarterback position, you really need to have a viable number two. You know, for as much as I can't stand the Patriots, there's a reason that they're holding on to Garoppolo right now. You know, he's he's the heir apparent, and he he got it. He has it made right now. Just sitting on the bench, get collecting the check, hanging out. You know. If something happens to Brady, they have a functioning quarterback there that saw live game reps and didn't perform well. If Ben goes down, we're, we're looking at two bums right now that the man, the front office should be looking at this and saying it, Ben's at a point in his career where how many more years does he have left? He's already starting to talk retirement. They got to get themselves in a position where find find who that next guy is. If if you really think it's Landry Jones or you really think it's Josh Dobbs, great, but you better show me some more than what I've been seeing. Well, not only do the Patriots have one guy, they actively have a backup quarterback battle with Garoppolo and Brissett. Brissett filled in whenever Garoppolo went down last year and got them a win. And he looked good doing it. I think he was a rookie. He played well at NC State. Very smart guy. He's out there. He's able to make reads. So they effectively have Tom Brady and then a very competitive battle between two guys for the backup spot. And Steelers are left with nobody. I mean, the thing that scares me is if we're going to get into a Viking scenario. When Bridgewater went down, who who did they have to pick up? Sam Bradford? And what did Sam Bradford do for that team? Took pretty much a great team and made a mediocre. And that's what the Steelers are right now. I think the Patriots are a clear number one in the AFC Steelers, there's a gap. There's definitely a gap between the Patriots and the Steelers, but the Steelers are number two. And then below that, it's everyone else. So if if you look at it from that perspective and Ben goes down, the Steelers fall back into that pack and it's anyone's game after that. I fully expect a healthy Ben to play a healthy Tom Brady Patriots in the AFC Championship game again. And if he gets hurt or something happens, man, is there going to be a huge drop off? Uh, but do you guys have any final thoughts on that before we kick into uh, fantasy football talk? Rick? Yeah, I think I'm good. No, the only thought that I have is to go back to Matt's point is maybe these uh, this training camp affects quarterbacks in a way. 
because they don't get as many reps and they don't get as many reps as they would normally say six or seven years ago where they had tons of reps and training and were in more pads and more scenarios. Maybe it affects the younger quarterbacks. I don't know. Just a theory out there. I'm no quarterback expert. I would love to hear one of those speak on that topic. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know. Training camp, the speed of the game goes up, but we're going to go ahead and transition now into fantasy wide receiver talk. So first off, we're talking two positions today, wide receivers and tight ends. And this is the advice Rick gave in the intro. Definitely do your research. Look at points because I'm going to bring up the ESPN rankings for both of these positions. And I want you to take a look at the values that they assigned. And I'm going to kind of read them for the guys that are audio only. But the ones that they have, they're definitely favoring wide receivers when you can definitely have a top tight end fill that top receiver position for you. Um, if you're looking at it in terms of like a bulk position. So you have our league, I think, has three wide receiver slots, a tight end and a flex now, I play my flex. It's either going to be a number two tight end, a wide receiver, or a running back. And like I said previously, that depends on the matchup and kind of I filter around a bunch depending on who's hot and who's not. Last year, like I played flex based on who I could pick up in free agency. I picked up a guy whose name's escaping me for the Jets, who was basically a one week or two week wonder, I think. I got him after his first big week, and he helped me win a playoff game. That's how I play the flex. So basically when I'm drafted, I'm looking at one tight end and four wide receivers from top, and then I fill in if I need another tight end, I can pick one up later. But I'm going to go ahead and bring up their list. So at the top of their list, they have number one wide receiver, Antonio Brown. Uh, he They have him at $56, which again, I think their their ratings are off or their dollar amounts are off. Uh, number two, they have Julio Jones at $52. Three, Odell Beckham, $50. Four, Mike Evans. I would never draft Mike Evans at four for $50. There's no way. Uh, number five, AJ Green. He's $50 also, so I guess he could be a flip. I definitely would put AJ Green above Mike Evans. Uh, Jordy Nelson, I would probably put above Mike Evans too. They have him sixth for $47. T.Y. Hilton. I would never draft him. He would never be in my top 10. He's $45. Uh, Michael Thomas, same thing. They're not consistent enough for me. Uh, $43. The T.Y. Hilton one, going back to him quick, is also because you can't count on luck to stay healthy. So once he's out, then who's throwing him the ball? No one. Uh, Nine, they have Des Bryant for $39. And last, Amari Cooper for $37. So if you're listening to the podcast... Give me some feedback. I know some of these are tough if I'm just reading off numbers, but I'm trying to make it as uh, clean as possible for those guys listening at home. Uh, so my thoughts real quick. I I find value in guys who aren't in the top 10. I think the only guy I had on my team last year on this list was Amari Cooper, and they didn't even have him in the top 10 on this list. And I definitely didn't pay $37 for him, I don't think. Maybe he was in the 20s. I know that he was my highest paid receiver. Uh, but like I said, some of the guys are too inconsistent for me. Mike Evans, I know he seems to be he seems to go high every year. I'm not keen too much on the uh, the Buccaneers. I think that's who he's still with. Getting him looks. You could say the same thing for AJ Green though too, with the Bengals. Jordy Nelson, as long as he's healthy, I would put him up there at number four. Um, but the rest of them, Dez, you could probably put Dez at five if, if you wanted to kick A.J. Green down, but I would, I'd would i probably keep A.J. Green at five. So that's the top receivers. They have them slotted. So they have ESPN has an overall position rank, so the receivers go from number three down. These are all top 20 draft picks. That means that you're going to have to draft two receivers in the first two rounds is what they recommend. So, or one or two receivers in the first two rounds, uh, depending if you get like a quarterback mixed in there or their main other pick, I think we talked about was running packs. So ideally you would get a running back either round one or round two and a, and a wide receiver. 
If you wanted to go two running backs, that's up to you. It depends on your on your league, but definitely try to split between a wide receiver and a running back unless you wanted to go all out for Aaron Rodgers. Uh, but um, I'll let these guys talk now. Go ahead, Rick. You can start this one off. What do you think of receivers for fantasy football? I agree with the top three, Brown, Jones, and Beckham in that order. I think those are three consistent players, you know, year in and year out. I mean, I think they always put up the catches, they always put up the yards, and they put up the touchdowns. So I think those are it. I I just fear paying those prices. I think that's a little bit high with wide receivers. I think they're putting a lot of emphasis on them. Um, I mean, I like 9 and 10, Brian and Cooper right there because I think those are guys you're going to find value in and I don't understand the Mike Evans one as much that high I agree with you if you told me I had $50 and I could have Evans or Green I'm going to take AJ Green AJ Green's consistent Andy Dalton maybe not the best quarterback in the world but he always finds AJ Green so it seems like he's have he has good games too so um, some of these I don't understand Michael Thomas for 43 that's just insane I don't know what that thinking is there, but um, I think, again, you got to find guys that are consistent or guys that are maybe younger, maybe have the breakout year that's on this that team like the Raiders. Cooper was on the Raiders. They had a breakout season last year, really big, huge yards on that offense. So um, those are my thoughts there. So I'll turn it over to you guys back over. Matt, what are your thoughts before I give get into some more detail? Well, I, th- I think you can definitely find talent across the board. Um, I think it benefits you just like how we talk with the running backs. You want to have one, if you can, try to get one decent running back that's going to carry the ball for you. I think the same thing applies to the wide receivers. I know in my case, I, I'm a Julio Jones fan. He's been he's been my keeper in our league every year. I have him for around forty five dollars. There's no way that I, w- I could ever just draft him for that amount in any other any other league or any other you know auction style draft so knowing that he's one of the top players in the league he stays there a guy that's high on my list is Jarvis Landry unfortunately he's still being investigated right now for domestic domestic abuse so he could be a question mark he could end up being a guy that gets suspended but watching some dolphins games last year he was a guy that all game, I would sit there and watch it and be so frustrated that they weren't throwing him the ball. And then it'd be like the fourth quarter with five minutes left. They just started throwing him like quick screens and different stuff. He'd end up with like nine or ten catches and 200 yards and a touchdown. Like before the end of the game, it's like the whole time you're sitting there going, I'm at zero. I'm at zero point. I'm going to get nothing out of him. And then all of a sudden, he'd end up at the end of the game. They'd start giving him some opportunities to make some plays. I think with Mike Evans, I don't like him at four just because he – drop so many passes he gets a lot thrown to him but he's not taking advantage of it i think you want to find guys that are not only getting the ball thrown to him but are taking advantage of those opportunities once they they have the ball in their hands now just to get some stats mike evans did have the third overall receiver points i think for last year he actually had more touchdowns than i remember he had 12 which was looks like it's tied for second overall uh, Jordy Nelson was second, and like I said, I would I would still take him higher. He he was second overall last year in points behind Antonio Brown. Uh, the one question mark would be Beckham. I think last year he went for almost a hundred dollars in our league, which is ridiculous. It's almost half your budget, but he was inconsistent. And with his uh, whatever locker room problems he's having, I don't know if he's worth that high. Uh, but what I like to do at this position is go for value. So last year I said I got Amari Cooper. He wasn't a clear cut top 10. He snuck in there because Oakland had a good year, but I'm going down the list here. They have Doug Baldwin at 30. I had him last year and I got him in the twenties. So what I did was the first couple rounds, I got my running back. I got David Johnson who carried my team. And then I got, um, a tight end, I believe, which I'm trying to remember which one I even got, which we'll talk about that in a second anyway. But I went high on those, and then receivers I filled in right after that, and I got these mid-range guys that were getting me 9, 10 points a week, and that's enough to carry you. I had basically four options. Now, the one position I did neglect, 
I got really lucky. I got Matt Ryan for $2 last year, and he went through the roof. Without him, is my team as good? Probably not. Uh, but I did go definitely mid-range last year. Uh, another mid-range guy that I, I think might be better this year just because of the team change is Alshon Jeffrey. I would say he is my he's my dark horse. I've had him before. He's hard to stay on the field. So definitely try to get guys that don't get hurt. Uh, who was the one guy I had? I don't think this was last year, but two years ago. I had Keenan Allen. Which, oh my gosh. So I see this LAC abbreviation for forgetting that the Chargers moved to LA and I just think Clippers. So just off topic, I think the Chargers are definitely cursed by choosing that location and having the abbreviation LAC. They're tying themselves to the Clippers and it's not going to be good for them in the long run. Uh, but going through, I mean, Keenan Allen was awesome. He was a, a, a mid-range guy and then he got hurt two years ago and he hasn't really been the same. Uh, but he does give you consistent catches. So if you want a guy that's going to be reliable, you can get later. Look into him. I know Larry Fitzgerald is another one. He's he's great every year. He's going to get his catches. He's like one of the all-time greatest receivers in the league. So he's another guy that they, they undervalue because of his age that you're going to go ahead and be able to pick up later. So receivers is very, very deep just because most teams carry four or five guys that they play every time. If you play point per reception like our league, don't forget slot guys because like Matt said, the slot guys are going to be the ones that are catching passes. You, you're watching the end of a game. They need to get downfield. Slant, slant, slant. He might get three points right in a row. So definitely do not forget about those. And that's pretty much it what I have for receivers. Uh, if you guys want to go around – uh, Matt, you can kick it off this time. Any final thoughts on wide receivers? One of the things I think also to look at is look at the complementary receivers. So like with Tampa Bay, for as high as Mike Evans is, Deshaun Jackson's a guy that they signed in the offseason that could end up helping fantasy. If, if teams are going to be double teaming Evans, they're going to have the, they're going to have Deshaun Jackson there to s- stretch the field. You know, you look at Odell Beckham. He's a he's a quality top receiver, but then they also signed Brandon Marshall. So there's that that potential that for as good as those guys are, you may be getting just as much value out of some of these other guys that are complementary receivers that are opposite side of the field that they may get some looks just because the talent on the other side, even uh, Taylor Gabriel from the Falcons is going to be opposite or in the slot with julio jones you know they may end up getting some extra touches just because teams are going to be so conscientious of the antonio browns and julio joneses and obj's of the of the league so those are guys that later in a later round you can target and maybe get them on the cheap that would help benefit your team adding on to that quick before i get to you rick uh, another thing to think of too is special teams i'm looking here down the list i picked up tyreek hill last year and th- you got to look at your league rules first because we use the standard ESPN where if a guy scores a touchdown, whether it's a punt return or whatever, I think he gets points for it. And Tyreek Hill, he's a slot receiver. He was definitely my third guy. I nev- He was never number one or two. But there were weeks where he would – him and Travis Kelsey are running these cr- crossing routes every every week for the Chiefs. He's getting eight catches for like 18 yards, uh, getting me like nine points. And then he was he was returning a punt return for a touchdown. And a kickoff return for a touchdown, which is putting him in that upper echelon, getting me uh, double-digit points each week. So looking for that. If you're looking for even a flex guy, now that's a total crapshoot. Don't rely on that. But if you need a guy in a pinch, and like Matt said, look at the complimentary receivers. If you're getting down, if you're playing in a deep league, we played with 14 teams last year. So whenever you have 14 teams, everyone's carrying three receivers, you're going to run out of top guys. That's what I would recommend to go with. Look for outside things, outside ways that they can score, even if it's like maybe a guy that catches two-point receptions or something uh, that you might want to throw in there. But I'll let you go now, Rick. Final thoughts on wide receivers. I know we mentioned about new wide receivers and new places. The one that I see is Cooks out there. I think it's going to do a help and hurt. Help the Patriots. Now let's, you know, guys like Amendola, Edelman, and now Gronkowski – be freed up a little bit because Cooks is a good receiver 
and he's had some good years with the Saints. I think it's going to hurt the Saints now because that was one of their big play guys and helped them out a lot. So I think Cooks is definitely a positive to New England, and I think it's going to be somebody, another weapon that New England can utilize and can use in their system to figure it out. So they didn't have that, you know, big, tall, lengthy wide receiver that was a consistent catcher. They got him now. So I'm looking for him to have a big year. I think he's going to have a big year in that system. Well, that's a good uh, segue since you mentioned Gronkowski. We'll go ahead and jump right into tight ends now. Gronkowski is clear number one. They have him valued at $36. I want to say that last year when I said I drafted a top tight end, I think I got Jordan Reed, who which is, who was our number one available because Gronkowski has been on our keeper list. I can't remember if that was last year though. All my all my years are running together. Uh, but uh, according to ESPN, he's a 27th overall. Like I said, we're a 14 team league, so he definitely fits in the second round there. Uh, so once I got David Johnson, I'm pretty sure I picked him up next. And then I went for values because you can get him for around $30. Instead of spending $50 on a wide receiver, I teamed him up with, like I said, I went for Amari Cooper for 30 And then I went for Doug Baldwin, who's also around 30 That's three guys for $90. And I think I spent 70 on David Johnson or something, which takes up a big bulk of my, of my paycheck. That leaves me with $40 left to fill in. And it takes a good bit of luck then getting guys like Matt Ryan for $2 to fill in the rest of my roster. But that's that was my strategy last year, and I was able to win our division and end up winning the league, so it paid off. But I went for top positions like tight ends where there's only one or two top guys, and then there's a huge drop-off. So here even on the ESPN list, they have Travis Kelsey after Jordan Reed. He's third for $15. Then Greg Olson is fourth for $12, and then you get down into anybody's game. Delaney Walker, he's fifth for $6. Tyler Efert, he's – or no, he's sixth for $4. Delaney Walker is fifth. I don't know if I said that right. Kyle Rudolph, seventh for $4. Kyle Rudolph, he's a great check down guy if you're going cheap. Sam Bradford is definitely not slinging it down the field. So who's going to catch all those dump-offs? Kyle Rudolph. He'll, he'll, he'll be like my uh, – who who'd I say I had Tyreek Tyreek Hill. He'll be he'll be the guy that gets you eight catches for 12 yards. Kyle Rudolph, possibly a touchdown if the, if the Vikings Don't go ever stealing score. my guy. Don't go <laughs> stealing my boy. Uh, Jimmy Graham, he's eight for $3. Zach Ertz, $2. One year I bought Zach Ertz. Hi, I cried every night that year. Um, Henry Hunter – or Hunter Henry, <laughs> $2.00. Uh, for a tenth so you can see once you're getting down in the top 10 guys are worth two dollars it's either a position you go early on and i want to say did jordan reed get hurt last year or was that the year before like i might even got burnt on that pick because i don't know if he played i'm not gonna look it up but um i do know that you have guys like that that you can go ahead get early and if you can't get them wait one year i picked up uh, for the Browns, who was that receiver or that tight end? Gary Barnage. Gary, Gary Barnage. Barnage. He he's valued at zero dollars right now, and he because he is a he's free a free agent. agent. Just like in our league, you never know who's going to pick him up. Um, it was maybe week five or six. Uh, the Browns changed quarterbacks. What a surprise once again! And it turned out that he was a ro- he was the roommate of the new quarterback. So I figured. Oh, what the hell? I'm not getting any production out of my tight end. I'll pick him up. And he went off for like double digit points for like the rest of the season. As long as that quarterback was in, Barnage was on my lineup because he was definitely the check down. And so you can get lucky like that. But tight end is very, very finicky. As you can see, if you go to ESPN's site and look for their list, uh, everyone after the 15th tight end or after the 14th tight end is valued at zero dollars. So basically, they're saying that these guys are going to be scrub positions. But I'll go ahead and look at just a point wise, and I'll have to tweet these out, these lists. So even yeah, looking down the list last year for points, these guys are still going to get you five to eight points a week. Going down to Zach Miller, who was rated twentieth for the Chicago last year, he was averaging seven point three points a game in fantasy, which isn't bad for a tight end. Uh, one of the ones who wasn't on the list, Cameron Brait, he was a pretty good. See on this list, 
Did he retire? Yep. No, no he's at sixteen. Zero dollars. Oh, zero dollar value. Well, he had the seventh overall points last year. Uh, hefty seven point six points per game. His average was, but possibly a guy you can get cheap. Maybe you want to get hang with him. I don't know. Overall, Travis Kelsey was the overall points leader last year, and then check down artist Kyle Rudolph with his seven touchdowns. His long was only 44 yards compared to 80 for Kelsey and 78 for number three, Greg Olson. So Kyle Rudolph, he's not going to go deep for you, but he'll get you points. But go ahead, Matt, and you have any uh, thoughts on tight ends this year? <clears throat> to me, tight ends always been a position that I really liked fantasy wise because I don't think, you know, once you get uh, once you get past Gronk, Reed, and Kelsey, it's not a glamorous position. There's it, there isn't the pop like you have the names with the wide receivers. So to me, in years past, I've always liked using two tight ends. And with the way my roster set up, you know, I was high on Eifert, and I had Rudolph as my two tight ends. And in a lot of weeks, they were they were producing a lot of points that. I was able to use, you know, one as my tight end, one as my flex, and I was getting more consistent points than I was out of like a Tavon Austin or someone that could either go for thirty, go for thirty points, or go for six points. You know, if if you're looking for someone, a lot of these tight ends they'll consistently get you between eight and fifteen points a game, depending on who they are. And if you get lucky and you get a and you catch a Barnage situation, then you know you're really set. I just found it interesting that for as much production as he had, when Cle- Cleveland is really high on that that uh, Njuku, David Njuku from Miami, because after they signed him, they released him. And I thought, you know, it, it got me thinking as we were transitioning, where's he even at? Because I hadn't heard his name being mentioned at all, and he's he's a free agent. So it really is surprising for a guy that had the production in the passing game that he had that he's sitting at home right now. It just surprises me. Rick, what are your thoughts? I, I, I'm looking at tight end, and this is one of those positions where you either got to be a quick buyer to the market to get one of these top guys, or you're going to get a guy that's kind of bunched in this middle here of where there's a bunch of similar type players all together that are in there. It's not like the years about 10 years ago where you had so many good players, but you really didn't have that really top echelon guy. Now it seems like you have about three or four top echelon guys and then a bunch of similar players. So it, I, I'm looking at these prices and thinking $36 for Gronk. Yeah, that seems good. You're going to get a guy consistent, but he also has injury questions. I think it was last year Jordan Reed did get hurt too. Um, so those two both have injury questions with them. So do you spend big money on a tight end who's had some injury questions throughout his career? Or do you say, nah, I'll hold back a little bit, go get a Kyle Rudolph for four bucks. So if he gets hurt, I only lose four bucks. It's not going to be big. And then you can easily find somebody else out there who could be a backup tight end. So, but uh, I think it's one of either a buyer beware if you go ahead and spend the big bucks. So um, I, I would say this for myself right now. I, I would fear paying those prices just because on a limited budget. You could be out big bucks in the first couple weeks with a guy with it injured for the season. Well, just to feed off that too, yeah, definitely look for a guy that's healthy and that's going to play every week. And like you said, Gronkowski, if he doesn't play, what's the point in paying that much for him? Uh, One other tip that I had, one year I actually ended up playing the second tight end for the Ravens. I forget what his name was that year because the first tight end was a blocking tight end. He was rated higher, but every time they got down in the red zone, John Harbaugh would throw in his two tight end set, and my guy was getting a touchdown like every week. And I just rolled with it, figured ah, if he gets a touchdown, that's six extra points I wouldn't have had. Uh, so definitely look at the scheme. Don't think, okay, well, there's a big name guy. If he goes to a new team, new quarterback, something happens. If he's primarily a, a blocking tight end he's not going to get you many points so you definitely want a tight end that's running out in routes and that's where it used to be helpful like when a team that had like Peyton Manning for instance you knew 
tight end was his safety valve. Didn't matter who he had in there. They were going to get consistent points. Now with the way the league's running spread, I don't know if you'd really have that many options. That might be why a bunch of these guys are, are bunched in together. Not that many teams are actually spreading it out and doing a more pass-oriented offense. It's more run-pass option where they're hitting slot guys running outs or running slants. So that's my final thoughts on tight ends. Uh, do you guys have any final thoughts before we go into our NFL previews? Get you a tight end that can get good production, and I think it'll help carry your team. All right. We'll go ahead and use those words of wisdom to kick into our preview of the AFC South. We'll start with them. The AFC South, to me, is a division that's pretty much meh. Are there good teams here? No. No, I'm confident in saying that. Are there decent teams here? Yeah, probably. I don't. I just don't see any of these teams separating themselves yet. A lot of young, a lot of movements. I'm not high on Andrew Luck. I think Andrew Luck is a product of Jim Harbaugh's coaching because he was a four star recruit. Definitely, you have a quarterback guru who who makes Colin Kaepernick go to the the Super Bowl. Makes Alex Smith who was basically a pariah down there in San Francisco, ready to be run out of the league. He turns him into a great trade candidate, free agent for the Chiefs. I forget how he got there, but definitely made him a valuable piece. And you get Andrew Luck in the league, can't stay healthy. I mean, he's definitely a serviceable quarterback. But um, I had the Colts low. I had the Jags low. I had everyone here uh, between six and nine wins, which is what we have here. I had the Jags at six. I think I had the Colts at seven. Where's my list? Yeah, I have the Colts at seven, and I have the Texans at eight, and I have the Titans at nine. So basically, right in order, no one really separating themselves. I wouldn't be surprised if the Texans won the division. I think they have the best coach. But Bill O'Brien, I mean, he did a great job at Penn State, and I would think that he would just come in and run uh, the similar style, but it doesn't seem like he can get an offense going really at Houston. And it's baffling because they had some good rod receivers. I mean, it had to be frustrating. I think Andre Johnson, he retired, didn't he? Like you have guys that they're not getting the looks. He was like a premier wide receiver. Bill O'Brien gets there. He can't do anything. And then he just like retires out of what frustration? I don't know. So... Well, he ended up with the Colts and was doing absolutely nothing there. Yeah, I don't know if it was just a career thing that happened to him, but it was a weird situation. And who else did they have at wide receiver that's really good? Uh, Hopkins. Hopkins. Yeah, they have Hopkins, which is another one. I mean, he's a deep threat. You would think that they'd be able to move the ball, but just not consistent. So I think they're a couple years away, all the teams in this division. I don't think they're going to be in the AFC Championship game. Even if, like, the Steelers falter, I would be shocked if one of these teams made it to the AFC Championship game. I could be wrong, uh, but I don't really have a lot of comments. I mean, everyone's kind of – nothing gets me excited. What I wanted to tune in, they're not one of the best teams. I consider, like, the Patriots, you can't miss that game if they're playing. Some of the other teams could have more exciting. These teams here in the AFC South, nothing to get me going this year. Uh, we'll let you kick this one off, Rick. What are your thoughts on the AFC South? Pretty much agreeing a lot with those win predictions. I mean, a lot of teams that are, you know, stagnant or have flaws somewhere. The Jaguars offense was not that good last year. When ha- when Luck got injured, Colts were definitely not good. Bill O'Brien, um, I'm going to differ on you, uh, Richie, just a little bit. I'm going to say he's probably not the best coach in the division. Uh, just because he was his quarterback guru, and yet Brock Osweiler looked lost in those games that he was out there. So, uh, I mean, he couldn't make him a start, and they trade him to Cleveland. So my my question is, is, is Watson going to be the guy? Is Watson going to be the guy of the future that puts these guys over the top? I, that, I think that's the one thing that I will say. I think Titans have the best overall roster. So I, that's why I kind of picked them to be the champions of the division. 
But I think Watson, if he progresses and Bill O'Brien becomes the quarterback guru again, this Texans could be the team that we're talking about two, three, four years down the road. But I'm going to give it to the Titans. Just I think they had the better overall team between offense and defense. So, but that's my thoughts. But this is this division is not a good one here. Matt, what do you think? I think as Marcus Mariota health goes is how the division's going to go. If he stays healthy and he can run the ball and he can do the things that he did last year and showed. I think it's Tennessee's division to lose. I think as as they're, you know, he takes his injuries, and you kind of look at him being in the same boat as a Cam Newton. That if you're going to have part of your offense being quarterback running based, then you run the risk of getting your quarterback injured. And as he got hurt late last year, it really put a damper on Tennessee's chances of making the playoffs. Now, one thing that I will say is I think the Jags, even though they're, I don't think. They're a very good football team. I think they're getting closer to contending where I think the Texans have Watson. And I think he's going to be two or three years away from really producing and contending for the division. I think the Jags have enough with Bortles as a game manager, drafting Leonard Fournette and getting their defense healthy, you know, having Melvin or having the Fowler guy and playing well, they got, uh, Oh, one of their corners, it was just activated off of the pup list. Um, you know, I think is, is they have the, the most potential to improve. But again, I, I think it just depends on if Mariota stays healthy, it's Tennessee's. I think they run away with it. Yeah. If health is a big one, I think, I just think the Colts, like their time might have, has passed them. They need to do some type of rebuild. The Texans, like you said, they're a couple years away. I do like Watson, and I think he's going to be a good one for them. But at that point, is the defense still going to be good? I don't know. Yeah, if Mariota stays healthy, the Titans have the best chance of making it in the playoffs. But would I be surprised if something crazy happened with the Jaguars able to move the ball on the ground if they won the division? No. I mean, there's not that much separation right now that I think any of these teams could win it, and I wouldn't be surprised. This is honestly the toughest division I had to pick. Now, uh, any final thoughts before we kick into the NFC, guys? Now, the NFC... Dumpster fire. Yeah. The NFC is different. This one, we're about one win up. So just for the guys at home, I don't know if I actually read our win predictions. So the AFC win predictions, the Titans we had at nine wins, the Texans at nine, Colts at eight, and Jaguars at six. In the NFC, we have the Falcons at 10, Panthers at nine, Saints at seven, and the Buccaneers at seven. I'll start at the bottom. I actually think the Saints should be at the bottom. We had them tied. I think the percentage actually ended up being the exact same. Uh, But the Saints... I feel like their past and they're on their downturn is they're just waiting for something to happen to Drew Brees. As long as he's in the league, they'll be competitive and able to win some games. But I just don't think they have the actual roster to compete. The Buccaneers, on the other hand, everything's trending up for them. And that's why I think this is going to be the tightest division race in a good way. Unlike the AFC South, where it's kind of like, Hey, winner, you get a you get a participation trophy. You get that first round uh, beating by whoever you get matched up against. M- maybe even a wild card. Who knows? Um, which I think it is would have to be a wild card. But the NFC, you have the Buccaneers who could who could play up. Winston sh- has shown flashes. He could be good. Uh, they're high on Evans. If he can get some catches, keep getting separation, get some points. I could see the Buccaneers winning this division. But, of course, they also have to contend with the previous two winners who both went to the Super Bowl. Panthers last year, they didn't really lose a lot of pieces. I think a lot of people were surprised that they had the Super Bowl hangover. I knew they lost a couple weapons on offense, but I think most expected Cam Newton to be able to move the ball. I actually predicted the Panthers to win the division this year. Uh, They're starting to get some more weapons with McCaffrey. I know it's only a preseason, but he looks pretty decent in space. And if they can give Cam Newton a running back that can catch the ball 
out of the backfield like McCaffrey can give him some separation, I think it will help the offense because you also have a good pass receiving tight end in Greg Olson and you have some bigger wide receivers uh, like they have in Devin Funches. I think the Panthers are going to come around and they're finally going to give the Falcons a run. I think I had that. I had them at 10. No, I had them at 11 and the Falcons at 10. Uh, so I think the Falcons are going to take a step back. Not as big as what the Panthers did last year. But I just don't think they can mentally come back from being so close to a Super Bowl and how close they were. Any play that would have went the other way. A drop pass, one little deflection, Falcons win the game. Everything had to go wrong for them. And I think the Patriots kind of showed that, hey, they got the formula. The Falcons were the ones last year running the offense, high high, um, high action, high scoring, moving the ball. I think most defenses kind of sat back and let the Falcons do their thing. I don't want to say like the regular prevent defense that most defenses run that never works. And then the Patriots just kind of showed them like, hey, if we start throwing the ball all over these guys, they're not going to stop it. And then you get them flustered. The Falcons aren't going to be able to run the ball. They couldn't run the clock out. They ended up throwing the ball to try to get the clock run out. And I think that's going to give other teams a formula where, hey, we're going to put the pressure on the Falcons to not only score, but outscore us. And I just don't think it's going to be I think it's going to be a year away. They're going to have a down year after being so close. And it's not a factor of, I mean, they're going to have the toughest schedule. They were in the Super Bowl, one of the toughest schedules. But it's also just because their division is so good. I could see them splitting with every team in this division. It's going to be the tougher schedule that does them in. So go ahead, Matt. You can kick this one off. I know you're high on the Falcons. What are your reasons? I mean, we... With last season, we we spent a lot of time talking about the Falcons and their offense. And for years, it's been the offense carries it and the defense is just awful. Well, I think they finally got enough balance with the younger players on their team and having guys like Beasley that can make the defensive plays and get some stops and buy their offense some extra time that I I think Atlanta definitely has a chance to do it. The team that I'd like to see push is I'd love to see Tampa Bay get in that position, but I think the extra media with being in the focus of HBO's Hard Knock series I think is a bit of a distraction. Um, You do see that they have – they invested in uh, O.J. Howard, the tight end from Alabama. They picked up Deshaun Jackson. They're trying to get – the weapons for Jameis Winston so that he doesn't have to force the ball and rely as much. You know, I think last year he had a good number of interceptions, but a lot of it was him just trying to force the ball down the field. Um, if he can if he can take what the defense gives him and just learn to just take those smaller yardage cl- chunks and just take what they give him, take the easy money, and it it'll, should lead to more points, more production, and hopefully a couple more wins. The, the team that scares me is the combination of Carolina and New Orleans because with Carolina, if Cam Newton goes, so does their offense. And with New Orleans, with trying to pick up Adrian Peterson, he's a stub toe away from being out for the year. So as those guys get hurt, they put them at risk of of having their, their team collapse around them. Rick, what are your thoughts? I think the way I look about comparing these two teams is South or the AFC versus the NFC is if it's the Thursday night game during week 10 and you pick any two out of the AFC, I'm not watching it. Now, if it's the NFC, and you pick any two week 10 Thursday night. I'm watching it because these teams are going to be good and they're all going to be fighting each other for that top spot. And there's, I would say three out of the four definitely have a chance to win it. Falcons, Panthers, Bucks. I'm going to say Saints are going to clinch fourth. They're an old team. And I believe if you look on ESPN's rankings, the worst defense by people that are drafting right now is the Saints defense. And I, if they're going to lose, they're going to lose because that defense can't stop anybody. And especially with, I would say, three teams that are very good in offense, I don't think they can stop them. And I think that's going to be the reason why they lose in this division. And I think these could be there could be a lot of shootout type games in this one. 
And I will say this. There's a possibility that the offensive rookie of the year could come out of this conference, either in, as Matt mentioned, Howard or McCaffrey have a good shot at it just because they have good teams around them. Just like Ezekiel Elliott last year had a good team around them in Dallas that made him look good. These two guys have good teams around them that make them look good. Somewhat of a missing piece that they needed. So I, I still think the Falcons are going to be number one. But I would say I could see the Panthers and the Bucks having – Panthers definitely having more than nine wins. And the Bucks have a good chance of having definitely more than seven wins too. So I think McCaffrey's going to be that one spot that's going to help keep the pressure off Cam Newton. Because I believe if I was li- listening to it, he almost has twice the quarterback hits of any quarterback. I think in the past three or four years, his quarterback hits is almost double compared to any quarterback. So – It'll be nice to have that dump guy that you can dump the ball off to and maybe survive the getting hit again. You don't think that uh, Fournette's going to win the offensive, or do they do one both divisions? They do one in both one, one in AFC and one in NFC. Because he claimed that he was going to win the rushing title this year because of how easy it was to run against those scrubs he played against in the preseason game. He said the game was a lot slower than he expected. That, those were his quotes. I don't know if you guys saw them. I, I saw the Yeah, quote. that's a bold statement coming from LSU running back. Yeah. Wait until he faces J.J. Watt in uh, the Texans defense, and then let's see what he says after that game. Well, he was playing against a, that paid old Miss defense every year. <laughs> Tim DJ and whoever else well, they got. The, I tell you, the, the interview that I really liked recently, it was they had Ryan Leaf on NFL Network, and he talked about how different it is playing preseason versus regular season. And, and even he was one to say, oh, yeah, with the preseason games and you're seeing these lesser competition and scaled back playbooks, he said he was he felt like he was going to go to the Hall of Fame as a as a preseason quarterback. But then once you get it, hit the regular season and their game planning and they're putting their full package in and you're not just going up against some podunk trying to make the squad, it's a whole different ball game. And those windows that you know, you're know you looking into or the holes you're trying to run into are tighten. you got to rely on a lot more technique and it's to be seen whether they have those pieces for him to be successful. Well, speaking of that, let's end on this. Do you think that they should get rid of preseason altogether? Because I think that they should, and I'll give my reasons. People might not realize this, but the NFL preseason and stuff, that was way before anyone had any training experience. These NFL guys, like they barely worked out back in the day. So they threw these preseason together, and this is all sports, not just football. But all these meaningless spring training games, spring training – was in Florida because there was no Major League Baseball team in Florida. And they wanted to try to attract fans to watch their games. So they were like, let's take the states where they don't have teams in Arizona. Let's go to Florida. And then we'll try to attract team people to watch the games. Maybe they'll become attracted to some of these teams. NFL preseason was the same way. I don't think they were always played at the NFL stadiums. I, it might not be. Maybe that's just uh, limited to the NBA and the... Um, NHL, but I'm pretty sure the NFL was used kind of like the same thing. We're going to go to some lesser um, populated city in our state and try to get people to become attached to the team, and then maybe they'll buy merchandise or maybe they'll watch on TV and we can sell ads. Well, with the internet, you don't really need that anymore. So what I would like to do or what I would like to see is that they go ahead and let them rest their starters because the starters don't really want to do it. Maybe they could have one game like a play-in game, or I don't even know because I don't even think the players want that. Once you get so old, you really don't want to play. I mean, how how much do they really play a starter? A half? A quarter? Depending on how good they are, you don't really need to play much. I would like to see them switch to maybe a seven-on-seven. Or even if they wanted to go all out, they could just have like a half-squad flag football game or some type of like arena switch just to get the rookies playing. And do it maybe a month before the season started, just like in the summer to get to get real interest. Because you know, other than baseball, there's no sports going on in July. So if the NFL wanted extra promotion, why not throw together some seven on sevens 
like from all your rookie, your 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 guys you're signing, your free agent guys, bring them out, have big tournaments, and then kind of give them like a like a seven on seven trophy or something. I mean, it's it would be a great way to get some young receivers in the reps, even some veteran guys that maybe are new to the offense, just some competition. Uh, that's just my thoughts. But uh, what are your thoughts on preseason? You can go ahead and kick this one off, Rick. I have two thoughts on it. I For the NFL fans, they get stuck buying these if they're a season ticket or So Steeler fans out there get stuck buying these preseason tickets. It's ridiculous. I mean, you're not seeing the fan. You know, you're not seeing the stars. You're paying the regular season price to watch third, you know, the third string quarterback go out there and try to throw a pass and look awful. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous that they get forced. I mean, it stinks for a team like the Steelers because they sell out every game. But if you're a Cleveland Browns fan, they're not selling out games. So it doesn't matter. You don't have to be a season ticket holder. You could just go up to the window the day of the game and buy the ticket. So that kind of stinks there. Um, Richie, I kind of like your idea. They kind of do that in the AHL for hockey, for which is the AAA hockey, that look, they get together the regional teams and they'll play like, they'll play like a tournament um, just real quick. And that's their preseason. They'll play three games. So four teams will get together, play three games. You play everybody in it. And that's pretty much your, um, you know, your preseason. I mean, the NHL still does it a little bit. They try to venture out at least one game can't be at their home stadium. So at least one home game they have to take somewhere else. Um, I know Buffalo will come back. We'll go to state college every year to play. That seems to be theirs. Uh, lucky enough, two out of the past three years, Hockeyville has been a, pe- a penguin or close to Penguin City. So they get the penguins have been able to go to close cities to play. But I mean, it's a little bit disappointing that way. But I agree to try to take the game somewhere else, especially if you're not bringing the big stars. Who, who wants to go watch the Steelers when Harrison and Big Ben and Bell and Brown aren't even showing up, you know, to play? Matt, what are your thoughts? I see it from a fan side, and the game absolutely – some of these preseason games are really difficult to watch. But from a coaching standpoint, I like the preseason games because as you're trying to figure out exactly what you have on your team and as you're trying to make those roster cuts to decide who the best – guys are going to be for your roster sometimes you can't tell in training camp what a guy can do or just for the the sake of saving your own players you know you may not want to run the inner squad scrimmages and doing hitting your own guys and potentially putting them at risk so it's it's nice to be able to have those preseason games where you can hit somebody else in another uniform you can get that game day feel and you know you can have a guy like a terrell Davis that goes out and makes a, a special teams play or does something that catches an eye that then lands him on a roster. You know, that you're never going to see those kinds of splash plays in practice that, you know, can, can turn someone's life around. So, I mean, in that aspect, I, I really do think that the preseason game games are important and even if you you left it to the players and, and tried to have some kind of spring game you know i i don't know how many w- you would get it would have to be something you know league league prepared but that i think there would be a lot of extra hoops to jump through because of the players association and trying to give time off i think it would be a tough hurdle to get through but you know, it, it could be something, but I, I think that more than likely with the mini camps and all the stuff that they do through the, the early part of May and June leading into camp, it's probably not going to happen. Well, I'll say, just to play some devil's advocate here, they're getting pressure. They want to add another regular season game. They've been talking about it for years now. Fans don't want that because they already have to sit through these preseason games. If they totally got rid of preseason games, I understand where you're coming from a coaching perspective. But I think it would help out with the longevity in the league because a lot of teams are cutting veterans early in the summer because they know, oh, we'll go ahead as we're making these first roster cuts. Let's get rid of some veterans. And then we'll go ahead like um, Barnage, like we talked about. He's a free agent right now. Cut some veterans and we'll just bring some rookies in. They're going to be cheaper. And we'll see if anyone uh, shows us something in the preseason game. So I think if you got rid of preseason games, you're going to see your players stick around more, which would help keep fans in. Fans don't want to – they're not going to want to learn 
guys every new year. I mean, look at teams that always have turnovers like the Browns. Would you feel safe buying a Browns jersey? No. I mean, you can't tell me that you would because they they have a rotating cast here. So what I would say is start, add that 18th game or whatever limit you want. Get rid of preseason totally. Have it be like college. How exciting is college's first week? If the NFL is really worried about, because they're, they're getting pressure from like ESPN and all the TV partners are trying to put pressure on saying that their ratings are dropping. Well, what way to bring up ratings is if every game matters and they start some push for that. And it's kind of like college. Yeah, it's going to be up to the coach to get the guys ready. And maybe the first week there's going to be some mistakes, but you're damn well going to know that that's going to be an exciting week of football. Yeah, the guy might make a bad read, but it's going to get some younger team that's going to get people in. Maybe the Browns come out the first week. You know, I'm 100% confident on the Steelers already from the preseason against the Browns week one. But if there was no preseason, would I be so confident? I don't know. Who knows what the Browns have? A bunch of like young guys coming out. Who knows? So throwing a seven on seven or even like a half squad scrimmage in, in July would just be a way kind of like the NBA is trying to do with their summer league. ESPN's able to promote it. Like, look at all these summer league guys. Do the games matter? No. Are people watching them? I guess they are. I guess people are even watching this uh, three-on-three league that Ice Cube's throwing together because there's not that extra sport. So why can't the NFL, if they really want to give some young guys a chance, put a seven-on-seven together? You're going to see game speed against uh, guys fighting for spots, cornerbacks, DNs, or whatever, uh, or defensive backs, safeties. And then you're going to have guys like Barnage who have a chance to make a roster. What are you doing on seven on sevens? Are you able to find that soft spot in the zone every play for us or not? Just some, something I'm throwing out there as a way to extend the NFL. They want to make it a year round sport. Right now, the summer's a dead period besides camps. So why not throw some camps together and have seven on sevens? And like Rick said, bring them to the smaller cities like uh, AAA does. Uh, the Panthers get like McCaffrey or whoever. Would you rather have McCaffrey taking hits or even Fournette taking hits in the preseason games that don't matter before they even get on the field? Or would you rather have them just running routes in a seven on seven? If you're the guy investing in these, these running backs in the first round, because you already know they have a short shelf life. I'd like to see an option like that. Something not as extreme. I know they're trying to get a spring league started. You don't have to go to that extreme route. Would I watch spring league? Yeah, I definitely will. But other than that, give me something else, another alternative just to whet my appetite. Let me get pumped up seeing McCaffrey run a couple uh, hitches in 7-on-7 and then breaking some open field runs. Let me see some of the Steelers, uh, like uh, Smith Schuster or whatever that guy's name is, the new rookie, the guy with two names, Juju. Let me see what he looks like running against NFL guys. That's what I want to see instead of waiting for the preseason when I see some half-ass football, and they make you pay for it. And you don't really want to attend those games. You don't really want to watch them. But that's my end of my rant. Probably took us over longer than normal. Uh, what are your guys' final thoughts before we end here? Matt, you can kick it off. One of the things that I saw recently out in California, a, f- a former I don't know if his former was a high school student that was playing football and he's now suing for over $150,000 in damage because he claims that the coach opted not to play him displayed a pattern of harassment and bullying. So by not playing him, he's saying that he was bullied and is trying to sue for money. I hope the courts throw this out and he can suck it up, grow up and just accept the fact that maybe he wasn't good enough. You know, I, I hate seeing these where people throw it out and they feel entitled for stuff. Go out and earn it. So hopefully more people can develop that hard work and attitude and the world will be a better place. I agree with that. Rick, what are you what are your ending thoughts? Um Pirates lose again today. Uh lost to the Brewers three one. Uh Walker had a hit. Jared Hughes shut him down, and Keenan Broxton went a home run. So it's nice to see the Brewers the three guys who were former Pirates at one time making a difference. I think um, it's a little bit sad that the Pirates left all three of them go. They, they still 
can play baseball. So I think that's one thing. And Ryan Matthews cut today and still plans to play. So hopefully he'll find a home. So I, I think it's going to be tough. Uh, but we'll wait and see. There's a rash of running back injuries. He's right there available at the league minimum probably. That's true. Well, that's it. I think we went a little bit long this week. Uh, it's hard for me to tell because Periscope doesn't give me our run time. Um, but we'll be back next week. We're going to talk about the AFC and NFC West for our final predictions show. And we're also going to get into NFL defenses and kickers, NFL defenses and special teams for fantasy. So check back for that next week. Tell your friends, please subscribe. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next week.